All right, welcome to the Middle Tech Spotlight series, where we highlight entrepreneurs, investors, and ecosystem supporters that are building our startup ecosystem. We've been talking to founders consistently over the last four years, and we want to use this series to keep tabs on the companies being built here. Today, we're talking with Josh Lau of Nimble Systems, being built in Columbus, Ohio, but originally started here in Lexington, Kentucky. Nimble Systems has created a digital tool for managing medical records and practice operations, specifically for orthotics and prosthetics fields that deal with artificial limbs and supportive devices. Before diving in, we'd just like to highlight the sponsors that make all of this possible. Before highlighting our sponsors, we'd just like to state that the views and content shared on this platform do not necessarily reflect those of our show sponsors. Middle Tech is presented by KY Innovation, the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development's Office of Entrepreneurship. KY Innovation exists to support and develop Kentucky's startup ecosystem, and we are proud to be supported by an organization whose mission aligns so closely with ours. If you're a founder building in Kentucky, you need to check out the resources that KY Innovation has to offer. You can find more information by clicking the link in our show notes or going to kyinnovation.com. All right, Josh, here we are again. It's great catching up with you. You were one of our very early guests on Middle Tech. Uh, You've covered multiple different cities now, and it's awesome to hear that you're having some great success with Nimble Systems. So welcome back on the Middle Tech Podcast. Yeah, Logan, great to be back. I mean, um, thankfully we're still around and alive and thankfully growing, Um, but excited to give the update and catch up a little bit too. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, Well, before diving into too much of the, the updates yet, we'll start by just kind of giving us an elevator pitch of the business. So just kind of high level, tell us what Nimble Systems is. Uh, And then we'll get into, you know, how it started and how it's evolved into what it is today. Yeah. So um, with your intro, you probably hit like the elevator pitch, uh, like 50% of it. So we are a medical records and practice management system originally created for the orthotics and prosthetics industry, but now we're expanding horizontally into a broader category known as home medical, home medical equipment or HME. And for us, you know, we help manage patient records, scheduling, billing, all the above, but we do it in such an efficient way that our providers are able to spend less time sharding and then more time with the patients. Right. So just kind of making all of the processes more efficient throughout throughout the entire thing. Exactly. Um, so, so you kind of talked about, you know, how you guys started. So I mentioned you started here in Lexington. Talk a little bit about the evolution of this business. And we'll use that kind of as a, a segue to get into going from Lexington to Phoenix. And then now you're in, in Columbus. Um, but talk a little bit about the update with the business. What, what's primarily changed there? Yeah. What's primarily has changed um, from our standpoint, development support is still full remote operations are now centrally located in Columbus, Ohio now. And we sort of saw this coming. Uh, we were full remote, you know, a little bit before COVID, and then that's when I moved out to Phoenix for about a year and a half. Met some that community was amazing as well um, in terms of you know angel investment, um, a round, and then they had some really really high growth companies that had successful exits there. So learned a lot and still tied in somewhat uh, to those advisors and investors. Um, but as far as you know, from a growth standpoint, currently the team we're about thirty people now. Uh, about ready to hire, I'd say twenty more in the next 90 to 120 days, uh, working with our lead investor, Tamron Hill, here out of Columbus as well. They have a focus on manufacturing and healthcare, which is kind of perfect for us. Uh, and the industry we're in sort of blends the two together. So uh, gearing up to close around, almost double the team size, right? And then for us, on the ops side, really wanted everyone together. Um, and Columbus was a great place to sort of land there. Yeah, Columbus actually has a really robust startup ecosystem from from what I've heard. I've gotten to visit a few times and really enjoyed my time in the city. Um, but before we talk too much about Columbus, let's talk just about you know what prompted the move from Lexington to Phoenix initially. Um, so I know it was you know had to do with with raising capital, which is a big topic of discussion, especially with middle tech. We're always trying to shed some light on you know what's going well here what could be improved about this ecosystem and i know that was one of the things that you're pretty outspoken about last time you came on is you know not not necessarily having access to the resources you needed while you were here so just candidly tell us you know how that move came about yeah so the move was um came through the opportunity right we were full remote and then we were we knew we were looking for a lead investor um for me 
being from Lexington, right, had pretty had a good feel of the local groups um, in the area at the time, but really didn't have any coastal connections. So ultimately, like I'm more of like a West Coast kind of guy. Wanted to land there eventually, you know, hopefully Cali somewhere, but was priced out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Phoenix was a great location, sort of up and coming. Uh, you know, cost of living wasn't too bad at the time, but moving there and seeing how the city uh, sort of got behind their startups, it was like a complete night and day difference than what was seen in Lexington. You had, you know, a handful of angel groups, even like a round type um, investors there, uh, you know, take five across and blow it to like a national level or like a regional level. And they had, uh, you know, that sort of pitch competition there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had groups coming in from, you know, Salt Lake, the Midwest, Denver, right, uh, to go to this competition to listen in. So for companies there, it wasn't grow at all costs, but it was just a lot more opportunity available, which was sort of different than Lexington. For me personally, I was sort of like out of that like startup phase. And then also um, before that, I guess before we closed this most recent round with Tamarind, you know, our market was very narrow and niche, um, which gave hesitancy to even, you know, those types of investors, right? It's like, you know, how big is the TAM? Like that really, that really wasn't too much of a concern because they understood that you could go deep within an industry. And even mm-hmm. though like, let's just say SaaS revenue for us may have been X, like if we had SaaS plus services, plus anything else, like X, Y, and Z, you know, it could equate to a hundred million plus type of business. Uh, so <laughs> those were sort of the discussions we were having, uh, you know, and groups out there sort of understood that uh, a lot better than the conversations we've had here in the Midwest until Tamarind. So yeah, Tamarind, right. Um, they sort of got, got that and they're more operational, which is what we're like in terms of like operating partner, which is what we were looking for. Uh, another reason why we came back. Okay. So yeah, talk about just get into detail with that. Like, you know, going through the fundraising process and, and trying to find the right partner is obviously one of the most important parts of, of fundraising, ensuring that you're aligned with your investors. Yeah. So just talk about that process and, and, you know, what really sealed the deal for making the move back. For sure. So moving out to Phoenix wasn't directly related to finding an investor. It was more just like getting into a bigger city and growing a network. Um, mm-hmm. At the time when I moved out there, we had some opportunity from private equity as well. Um, just, you know, execute a, a strategy, which ultimately like we ended up turning down. Um, but surfing back on the move back, right? Uh, we broke up, we broke the deal with private equity. It was sort of like coming back to market to actually fundraise. Um, and then when I mentioned the, you know, market size, things like that, that like even in Phoenix, like I got notes there. Right. And that was sort mm. of the big pushback, uh, was like, you know, is there really that large of a market? Right. And if you look at just orthotics and prosthetics, it probably isn't, but that was never the game plan. Right. And I never really articulated it well either. Um, but that's where working with Tamrind who has had that experience and like was able to see you know, going deep plus an adjacency, which is how we're expanding outside of orthotics and prosthetics now into um, complex rehab technologies, which is like powered wheelchairs, very similar to OMP still. And then this broader category of HME, um, you know, that's where we've been able to get to a major inflection point. So, you know, doubling year over year in terms of revenue, you know, hopefully three, four Xing this year, right? Uh, but as far as like the move back, majority of the team was still here in like, you know, Ohio, Kentucky, Alabama. And like I mentioned how we wanted to centralize ops, um, Columbus was sort of that midpoint. Um, so we, you know, started checking it out, seeing what the city was like. And as we, you know, did more research and came to visit, um, you know, start community here, pretty vibrant, you have some, uh, you know, bigger, larger companies, like even in the food services, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Wendy's out of here, L Brands, Cardinal Health. A lot of it from the startup scene, there's like um, a handful of fintech and healthcare startups here, which made it just even that much more appealing. Yeah. And we there's also some big VC firms based out of there, right? Like Drive Capital, I believe we had 
uh, Masha Kusid um, on the podcast from Drive Capital not too long ago. So there's, you know, there's the resources needed for founders to be successful up there too. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, well, let's move on to just talking about some of the challenges and success stories that you faced, you know, over the, your time building Nimble Systems. So let's start off with just some challenges. Talk about any, anything that comes to mind when you think of, you know, building this company, things that were really hard and what you learned from it. Yeah. Um, I guess if we take the lens of, you know, being in Lex or just even in general, it was, it's always been fundraising, right? Like, mm. uh, it was difficult in town and even moving to Phoenix, um, was difficult then. And, and when I actually started raising, it was at like the tail end of the COVID frenzy where valuations were like super high, right? People were trying to compete with, um, just like getting the deal. But even then it was like, still got notes, right? So yeah. for me personally, it was always the hill or getting over the hill of, you know, what does TAM and product look like, right? And now that we're that, uh, what we found in terms of like success and flipping that has been, uh, I guess it's opened up a whole new lane of possibilities. You know, we have growth equity groups interested. We have VC groups interested now, right now. Um, but again, probably a lot of that has been unlocked through a great lead investor and, you know, had someone with operational experience to come in and help refine the pitch, um, get the business model down and really unlocking those opportunities. Uh, so outside of like funding, I think I may have mentioned it last time. Talent's always been, you know, an issue, especially in a smaller Midwest city, uh, just yep. getting people to, you know, understand what a startup is, but like here in Columbus now, um, I didn't actually even realize how large the city was. I think it's like, you know, the 11th or 12th largest city in the U S something like that. Uh, one of the only cities in Ohio that's like growing, uh, if you like compared to like Cleveland or Cincinnati or something like that. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, having OSU here and just like more startups in the area, people are more familiar and like willing to take that risk. Right. So, I yeah. mean, I guess we're a little bit more mature now than what we were, you know, a year or two, three years ago, whenever I was on here last. Um, but I think I would say those were the challenges. So I mean, yeah. like, you know, going into the successes, right. Unlocking new markets or being able to take our product horizontal. Uh, and when I say new markets, they're not really like new markets. Uh, uh, they're like the sales process, training process, you know, it's all exactly the same, right. Yeah. Uh, ideal customer profile, pretty similar product. You know, we've spent maybe three, four months part-time, you know, modifying bits and pieces and we've been able to, you know, get get early validation there. Um, and then with that, you know, I think you mentioned it and I mentioned it early on, or we were that practice management and healthcare records management system, but where it gets super interesting now is, you know, um, we're a core system of record. So buzzword for anyone out there, not sure if, you know, you've heard that on speaking to your other groups and whatnot, but that allows us opportunity because we have like our clients use and enter every single piece of data available, right? Scheduling mm. records. We have last year, we had over $400 million worth of transactions flow through our platform. This year we're estimating over a billion, right? We wow. never monetize the transaction side. Um, but now we are like, we're getting into pieces of that. Um, you know, we're, we're able to charge SAS fees plus service fees plus transactions fees, right? Our, our clients are paying for this anyways through, you know, multiple different vendors. But mm. for us, uh, you know, centralizing it, streamlining that process, right? Making it more efficient, having one vendor you're dealing with um, has given us that lift. And yeah. then, uh, you know, has put, puts us in a position where, you know, whoever we want to integrate with, or we basically control that channel, um, that's really giving us opportunity. Like, that much more opportunity. Man, that is awesome. And, you know, that also just speaks to the stickiness of your platform, I'm sure as well. If you're entering all this, you know, mission critical sure. data about your business into your all's platform, it makes it very, very tough, um, makes it very high switching costs to go to anything else. So yep. uh, that's here. You've got the right plays out of the startup playbook for making <laughs> sure you have a, a, a big lifetime value and uh, low churn for your customers. For sure. So for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right. So just to kind of close this out here, 
talk about, you know, where you want to see this business get to uh, in the next three to five to 10 years. What's so let's start with three years and then get all the way to kind of your, your end goal with this. Yeah. Yeah. Three years. Let's see. I mean, we, by the end of this year, we'll probably have arguably anywhere from like 20 to 30% of the orthotic and prosthetic market. Right. Um, um, by three years, I mean, we're hoping to have, you know, 60% plus if we're looking at this industry, like in isolation, but then as we move outwards, right. In three years, we want to be in this larger, broader home medical equipment industry, you know, 10 X the market size, um, be able to have, you know, from a revenue standpoint, let's just say, I don't, I don't even want to throw a number out there. Just the opportunity available. Like we're still reworking our model right now. Um, yeah. but you know, let's just from market size perspective, uh, 20 ish percent in that space, which would be crazy uh, in, in three years, I would say, but we're coming with like mm -hmm. a full product. You know, we have a sales team, we have a repeatable sales motion now. Um, so that's been sort of uh, a big driver to our success, I guess, like getting sidetracked, sort of being back on the success part, right? Because like, we're not entering, like we're kind of entering a new market, but kind of not like if we're talking about sales metrics and, and high level numbers. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the sales metrics, like our lifetime value to customer acquisition cost right now, arguably is like eight to one, nine to one. Our <laughs> back on a customer probably like five months in the or five some prosthetic side now right like those numbers wow. are pretty crazy so we're i mean obviously we're scaling up the sales staff and you know it's going to go down a little bit but we're able to like replicate this process across this broader market um which has been great to see and it's like one of the learning points for us is you know getting a true sales process down to where we're able to bring in bdrs account execs and you know, have them yep. run this playbook and, and go, but three year plan, you know, from market size, there it is product standpoint. Um, I mean, I know AI automation sort of like the big buzzwords right now, but we are, you know, looking at sort of automating more of the medical billing side of things and even documentation. Right. So having that capability in our system would definitely be a huge differentiator. Um, then four or five years, who knows? Uh, but for us, you know, we because we have that core platform, that core system of record. I mean, for like if you're familiar with what an ERP system is, right? Like an Oracle, SAP, things like that. Yep. Like you know, like does inventory purchasing, all of that. That's where we're looking at taking the products. So we're evolving from just you know scheduling practice management into like this full suite of solutions for the market. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like that would be positioned perfectly for one of these private equity firms that wants to do kind of a bolt on yep. strategy where you like kind of, you acquire that core platform that is the center of everything. And then you also acquire some of these like ancillary platforms that can provide kind of this whole ecosystem. That's like very vertically integrated. Yep. It sounds like you guys are going to be positioned really well if you wanted to pursue that route. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that, you know, that was sort of like, that is the playbook for private equity, I guess, in this, yeah. space, right. Um, yep. it's M and a, whether, you know, acquiring legacy software is out there just for like a customer acquisition, doing these bolt-ons, um, and because, you know, our tech is what's leading our growth, you know, we're able to sort of iterate and integrate that a lot easier. Yeah. And yeah, just kind of a, a little antidote about, you know, um, some of the learnings from your challenges of fundraising uh, just to make the connection for the rest of the startup e ecosystem and just talk about the importance of like founder relationships and just relationships within the ecosystem. You played a big role in helping sales river get to the point where we were ready to raise. You just provided a lot of good guidance to us and advice. Um, and it, it really went a long way when we were kind of first stepping out into the uncharted waters of raising capital. And now it took us a while um, like it does everyone in this, in this region, but you know, we finally got to the point where we raised a, a $4 million series A and you were one of the first people that I connected our founder to when it was time to do that, just cause I knew how much experience you had with it. So, um, I guess just a big thanks for that. And, you know, it's awesome to see you having success with your own company in the way that you are. It's, it's, it's remarkable how much you guys have grown since we first had you on. Oh man, I don't even remember like what the company size is at then. I mean, we definitely <laughs> made strides, right? Um, we're no at doubt. the 
brink of that first inflection point, right? There's a lot of stuff we're proving out that we need to prove out for the remainder of the year. But luckily, mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, BQ1 projections pretty easily. We're on track to BQ2, but we'll see how Q3 and Q4 play out. Awesome, man. Well, we'll have to have you back on here in another year or two once you uh, have doubled or tripled your growth again. <laughs> for or sure. quadrupled, we'll see. Um, but thanks for taking the time to come on, man. And good luck as you uh, as you keep on building. Yeah, dude. Always. Always a pleasure. Thanks again for having me.